Appreciate it. Hey guys, how you doing? All right, last night we uh, introduced you to the title that you're an ambassador. Amen? I hope I'm in a room of a bunch of ambassadors for Christ, Pastor. Amen? That means wherever you go, you have something to say, and you ought to be talking about Jesus. Amen? At your home, with your children, uh, on your job, and even repeating the story to one another. We should never get over the fact that we were rescued. And as we sung, thank God for his mercy. Now this morning we want to move a little bit and we want to talk a little bit more about what we say within the body of Christ to one another. And what are we talking about? We've entitled it God's Wisdom. God has given us the opportunity if we will basically open ourselves up to receive his wisdom, that what is in our heart is what we communicate. There's a, our key verse is going to be out of James chapter 3, verse 13, where it says, who is, wise, who is a wise man endued with knowledge among you? That means he has understanding. Let him show it out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Now, God through his supernatural, perfect, divine intervention for us gave to us a chapter of the Bible that really messes us up. It's James chapter 3. And every time I go into the book of James, I'm reminded how much I need the Lord to control my tongue. Over in the book of Psalms, I believe it's Psalms, I think it's Psalms 39. David cries out and says, Lord, I will not sin with my tongue. That's how he opens that chapter. By the time he gets to the end of the chapter, David says, Lord, I can't do this. You must do it for me. So if we can learn that it's only through God's power and wisdom can we ever truly, truly control our tongues and use our words for kingdom work and to build up the body of Christ. There, there's a powerful verse, and, and we're going to show it up on the screen, James 1.19. It says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, amen, slow to speak and slow to wrath. Now, one of the unique things, and, and really this kind of came out of, I was going to say left field, but I guess left field, uh, that's where the bullpen was, and that's where, you know, I felt like, I said, you want me to do what? Talk about what we're saying? And then I began to look at my life. I am from a family of talkers. We're loud, and we could get mean by what we say. Uh, most people, if you rode by our house, you would think we were a bunch of Italians, man. We're loud. And, and don't ever come into the group and try to interject yourself. We will eat you alive. <laughs> but uh, I was in a family like that. And then uh, all through my childhood, high school, and college, I, I played on ball teams. And anybody that's ever been on a team understands you don't survive unless you learn how to give as well as take verbally. Man, just uh, let a ball go through the wicket, and you'll hear it for the two or three games. And, 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 and I learned to be sharp with my tongue. But the Holy Spirit interrupted my life. God came into my life. And that sharp edgy, 
put you in your place tongue of mine became a major hurdle for me to gain control over. And to this day, guys, it's only by the grace of God, moment by moment, day by day. I have used my tongue to hurt my wife, to inflict pain on my church members, to lash out at my family. It's, I'm telling you guys, we need to allow God to step in. Because words are very powerful. Words can either build you up or tear you down. You have the power by what you say to, to instill life, to inspire, or to even to depress a spirit. And even put paralyzed people by what we say. So this morning, we, last night, we, we talked about the big picture that, that Christ ought to be in the center of our conversation. This morning, we, we want to look at the focus, and the focus this morning is to consider the fact that as we interact with one another in the body of Christ, we ought to be strengthening the body by what we say, not bringing confusion and hurting the body by what we say. Now, what I want to do, just for the sake of, of, of bringing into focus, I want to read some scripture from James chapter 3. We're, we're not going to dissect all this. We're, we're going to go to the latter part of the third chapter and make our application there. So I'm giving you the introduction, then we're going to go right to the application. Okay? So we'll get you out of here before 3.30. Football's done, nothing's going on today. Let's just enjoy the word, amen? All right, man, that was very, very weak, and, and I can understand. <laughs> All right, look at verse uh, number three, James chapter three, verse three. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey. We turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships which though they be so great are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a small, very small hem or rudder. Wheresoever the, the pilot or the governor directs or listens, even so the tongue is a little member. Boasteth great things, behold how great a matter a little fire can kindle. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body. What that means is that the tongue has the ability to stain our lives. You know, if we get out of control by what we say, it not only stains us, but it stains other people by what we say. And collectively, as a body of Christ, as a church, a, a, as an assembly, if we're not careful, the words we say to one another can leave a stain on us and greatly affect us. That's what's being said here. I, I told you I wasn't going to dissect this, sorry. Son. But that was a good point. Okay. And settled on the fire, the course of nature. And is set on fire of hell. Verse 7. For every kind of beast and of the birds and of the serpent and of the things in the sea is tamed. And it has been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. That, that, that's one of those places you want to underline. It is an unruly evil. Full of Deadly poison. Amen. He kind of gives us a summation here. Therewith, bless we God, even the Father. Wherewith, curse we men, which are made after the same similitude of God. Out of our mouth, we praise God. 
Man, we go to a fellowship and we say something cutting. At the same mouth, we victory in Jesus. Then we go home. And we say something cutting to our wives. Something demeaning because our children are interrupting our time. Okay. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. Man, this is a great, great phrase you need to underline. My brothers, these things ought not to be. That's not the way we ought to act. We shouldn't praise God one moment and then curse the next moment. We shouldn't, uh, you, you know, uh, ju just have a great time in the teaching of Scripture, praise God, amen, amen, and then go on the job on Monday and forget and begin to, to get in groups and get in conversations and say things that tear people down, that cut people, rather than build them up. All right. He gives us a couple of illustrations here. Does a fountain send forth at the same place? Fresh water, sweet water? And bitter or salt water? No, that's not what happens, is it? Can the fig tree, my, my brothers, bear olive berries? Either a vine, figs, can, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh? He lays that out for us in, in such a way for us to understand that, that this is a challenge. But God has given us the resources that we can control what we say. Let me give you some, some takeaways from what we just read. First, the tongue is small, but powerful. I know you like I know myself. There's not a single man in this auditorium this morning that has not inserted your foot in your mouth. You guys who are married, amen. I know men, I be one. I've hurt my wife more by what I have said than anything else. We learn what to say, don't we? We get upset. We. I was in a situation. I, I was so proud of myself. I, I'm here doing a, a conference. I'm I, I'm supposed to be spiritual. I I get a phone call Friday. My wife. I haven't raked my backyard in a month. So she says, I'm going to love on my husband a little bit. I, I'm going to do the backyard. She does the backyard, and in the city of Savannah, you're not supposed to light a fire. Well, she, uh, she, she gets wood and sticks and leaves, and she almost catches my house on fire. My grandson calls me and says, Hey, Pop, uh, uh, man, it's burning the house now. <laughs> and I'm trying to be somewhat spiritual. And I, I, God help me. I said, Lord, please. We can always buy another house, I guess. And I'm telling you guys, it is so easy to use our tongues like a machete, especially with those who we dearly love. Amen? And I, 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 God intervened. 
I, I didn't lose it because, guys, I, I can lose it. I know I look like a nice guy. Man, listen, I'm, I, I'm not close all the time of losing it. And, man, I, uh, and, 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 and then you know, my grandson sends me a picture later on and says, by the way, Nana was cleaning the chandelier in the dining room and broke it. And he shows me a picture. It's crazy. It's, uh, I said, tell Nana to sit down and relax. <laughs> Pop will be back home Monday, and I, I'll fix all that. So I said, I was thinking about changing that chandelier anyway. You broke the chandelier, almost burned the house down, baby. I love you. Uh, you, you. You're beautiful. You still make my motor run, baby. I love you. Sit down. I'm telling you, it had been so easy, and I have done it so many times, inflicted pain. And listen, guys, hey, look, I married for beauty. I was looking for money, but I got beauty. That's all I got. But I married one virtuous, beautiful woman that loves Jesus. But I have inflicted more pain on her through this than anything. I just thank God that the other day, and I was thinking about it this morning as I was trying to put this thing together. I, I, said, I said, thank you, oh God, that, that I, did, I had to teach this this morning. Maybe the Spirit of God said, boy, yeah, you, you might as well get, get with Brownie. Tell Brownie, yeah, you better get somebody else to do this because yeah, you're going to fail this test. It's so easy. Look at this one. The tongue is necessary. Amen? We, we, we talked about it. Uh, your ambassadors, the high king of heaven has given you something to say. It, it, these tongues can do good. But they're dangerous. And destructive. They can destroy a church. They can destroy a child's life. One of the things a uh, uh, hundred years ago when I was first given the keys and I was a youth pastor, uh, the one thing I dealt with more than anything, Brownie, was teenagers with low esteem. Parents that had basically labeled their children abusive verbally. You know, if we're not careful, we... We do that in the body of Christ by what we say. And a lot of times, men who do that already have insecurities within them on, on themselves. The tongue can be helpful, but not reliable. So the summary truth is this. This should not be the case for the spirit-filled belief. We should be under the control of the Holy Spirit of God. And we're going we're gonna to kind of craft that together here through Scripture. Here's a couple powerful verses that kind of reminds us how this thing transpires. In Luke chapter number 6, it says, A good man out of good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. Whatever is in your heart comes out through your mouth. If your heart is corrupt, your words will be corrupt. If your heart is neg negative, if your heart is cynical, if your heart is critical, you will say critical words. There's not a disconnect. It's connected. Whatever controls your heart will come forth by what you say and how you say it. That's why this powerful verse there in Proverbs 4 Verse 23, keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. 
It's revealed. Our words are powerful. And, and they should be measured. I have, for four decades now, I mean, it's hard to believe. It seemed like I'm, I'm still so very young and good looking and all this thing. Hey, man, let revival break out here, buddy. But I've always been in a position of, of leadership for the most part in, in some fashion. When you're in leadership, you, uh, you get a lot of criticism. And that, that, I know that comes with the territory. I remember uh, some 26 years ago, almost 27, I went to the church I'm at right now. And, uh, man, oh, it was so difficult, so very difficult. Uh, the church really needed really to change directions and just a bunch of stuff going on. And I was taking a lot of flack from all over the place. Sunday in, Sunday out. Yeah. I mean, and, and it was just, I mean, but we were there and we were teaching and preaching and trying to love and, and go, if, go, go through this. It, and it, it was hard. There was a, I guess she was probably 70, 77, 78. Annie Mae Spikes, Annie Mae was about that tall, silver hair. I don't know if y'all remember her or not. Every Sunday morning, I'd, I'd preach and, and do the pastoral thing and do all that. Then I'd go out to the, the foyer and wait for the people to leave. Annie Mae would, would just kind of come up to me. She'd take my hand like this and just stroke it. And her soft, sweet, low voice. Brother Porter, we love you. I thank God that he sent you to be my pastor. We love Tammy. She is so pretty. I said, isn't she? We love her too. I'm just going to pray for you all week. I don't care what had happened. I was going to be in the pulpit next Sunday, Mark. Amen. We have that power. Here's an uneducated, just a housewife her whole life, given this preacher power through just stroking my hand. I remember when I did her funeral, I said, I'm going to miss you rubbing my old fat hand and telling me you thank God for me. We have the ability to speak life, to speak hope. We get that from gaining a godly wisdom where we understand how things really are. We gain a perspective of who he is. He is God, and we're not. We're not judges. We don't rule, and we don't reign. And if we're within the body of Christ, we are brothers together. And we should give one another great value. And do exactly what the Word of God teaches, that we ought to love one another. Now, how does this happen? How do we get this truth? There is the key truth in this whole paragraph here that we're going to deal with this morning. We're going to get, get moving a little quicker here in just a second. But the key truth is godly wisdom produces a godly perspective. Look what it says. Who is, wise, who is a wise man? And he understands or endued with knowledge. That, that means he has understanding among you. He has the right view. He has the right understanding. He has come to clearly understand how things really are. Those guys that are like that, they have that understanding. 
They, they have that perception. And then look what he says. Let him show it out of a good conversation, his works with meekness of wisdom. There's a, two phrases here that are very powerful. First, he is wise. He has a crystal and clear understanding as, as things really are. Do you understand this morning that you've been bought with a price? That you were a sinner that got rescued by Jesus Christ. That you are here, and we sung it earlier, you are only here because of the mercy of God. You're not here because you're great. You're not here because God said, he's a fantastic guy. We, we got to save Mark Brown. Man, he's going to be great on our team. There was no value whatsoever about Mark Brown other than the fact that God chose to love him. Amen? There's nothing great about me. And when you begin to understand that we're all trophies of God's grace, we all have eternal value before God. We are his children, and we are brothers in Christ. If there were ladies in here, they are our sisters in Christ. And as we encounter one another, that's the perspective we should have. Now, he uses a term here. He says, out of a good conversation, his word. The word conversation there carries with it a, a thought of, of having an understanding and, and, and having a the ability to recognize that you see things as they really are. Now, this godly wisdom produces two things. And the two things, first, a good behavior. A good behavior. Godly wisdom will produce a good conversation or good behavior. What the thought is, if you look at what that word means... In that Greek language, it means conversation is that this behavior has been produced by returning to something. Returning to something. It means this behavior you're seeing is as a result that this person has changed something, gone back to something original, something fundamental, and this fundamental truth has changed this behavior. Some of you have played sports before. Uh, you, you'll hear coaches say that. You, you, you help with the sports ministry here. They it said it's all about what? The fundamentals. I am an Atlanta Braves fan. Shepard Jones, Hall of Famer. Every now and then, Chip would get out of his swing. He'd call his daddy. His daddy would come to town and they would adjust and they would always use the term that says, I had to take Chipper back to where that swing started. He said, we had to get back. He, he, he was missing it. That's what this means. Is to go back to the truth to really understand how things really are. You belong to Christ. Those men that are sitting around you belong to Christ. So you should treat them by what you say and by what you do as Christ would treat them. Returning to the truth that you would act out the truth. That's the truth. And you also do that with a spirit of meekness, a spirit of meekness. Uh, the, this is a very interesting word, and I, I'm sure you, you've been taught it before. It means to exercise power and authority with gentleness and with control. Sometimes you may be in the right to exercise your authority, and there's nothing wrong with exercising authority. 
There's nothing wrong with as the spiritual leader in your home to exercise authority, but you should do it in a spirit of gentleness and meekness. That is a fruit of spiritual maturity. As you begin to understand, as you begin to recognize the fact that I want to do it as Christ would have it to do it. And, and as you go through the New Testament, it always tells us as we correct situations, as we fix behavior, we should always do it in a spirit of gentleness, of meekness. A lot of times, man, we, we blow up, don't we? I had, had this lady at, at a church I pastored many years ago, man, she... She'd blow up. That's, and, and I really didn't know what was going on. I'd, I'd been there for a short time, and, and someone came to me, and, and, and I said, well, what's wrong? I said, well, uh, and she told me the story. Something happened, and this lady talked to her, and I said, well, uh, I'll, I'll go talk to her about it. And I, I went and talked to her about it. I said, you know, she's really hurt. I, I hope y'all can get together. Oh, well, Pastor, I just, I, you know, it was a bad moment. I probably shouldn't have said that. And she blew it off. I said, man, mighty pastor fixed that. Well, a couple months later, another lady came to me. She said, pastor, I, I think we're going to be leaving the church. I said, well, why? And she told me she'd had this encounter with this other lady. He said, man, she, she was so ugly to me. And I don't know why. And it was that same lady that I had already talked to. Now, I'm not really sharp. So I go to her again and talk to her again. I said, now, y'all you, you, got to get together and, and fix it. Oh, well, Pastor, I, 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 I'm sorry that I will, yeah, I'll be like, Well, she went, but it didn't get patched up, and that family left. And, you know, I, I, I said to myself, well, those things happen, and I wasn't really bright. And so I, I just, hey, amen. Well, about six months later, I have a husband and wife that wanted to meet with me. They were upset because some lady had really gotten on to their teenage daughter. And you guessed it, it was that same lady. Well, I called her uh, one day and said I needed to meet with her. Met with her and her husband. And I, I said, you know, I, I figured something out here. You like to blow up on people. You got an issue. I said, we've, we're about to lose another family because you can't control blowing up. Well, you know, they shouldn't have done this, they shouldn't have done that. I said, there's a way to handle things. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell us to be angry with people and to beat people up for their advantage. And, you know, that was one of those rare moments, man. I, I lost it a little bit. It's so hard to reach people. I had two precious families that we most likely would lose. I learned a long time ago there's some people that will never truly understand. They're not the judge of people. They're not the, you know, the person that's been appointed in the church or in the fellowship to correct everyone. And when, when you're a common denominator, and I told her, I told her husband, I, I said, if you can't correct this behavior, you might need to look for that perfect church somewhere. They hung on for about a month and finally left, and it's like, man, revival broke out. I hope we don't have any guys in here like that. But that's what we mean to, to have authority. And, and, it, and it took me a while to learn that, that I am to, to reset people's lives gently, to walk into people's life gently. A right view is he's God. I'm the servant. And I have brothers and sisters in Christ that I'm called to help. 
Now, let's kind of put this together here. We're given a choice either to embrace godly wisdom or earthly wisdom. If we desire to inspire, encourage, build up others in their faith and offer hope, we must operate within the spirit and the wisdom and spirit of God. We must possess a spiritual perspective. Now, now, now the powerful thing that, that James does here, he begins to give us a contrast between one and the other. Look at, uh, look at the unwise, verse 14. He says, but if ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Man, that's unwise. That is earthly wisdom. Without God's wisdom reigning in the heart, lives are filled and attitudes are filled with the things that oppose God. Now, let's look at that list real quick. Bitterness. That's what we get. If God's not involved, we become bitter. We're filled with envy and jealousy. All, all that comes from the fact that we want to self-promote ourselves. You, you ever been in a conversation with someone and they use the personal pronoun over and over and over and over? I this and I that and I've done this and, and I think this and I want this and I ought to have that and I should. That's someone that is self-driven. There's nothing wrong with, with ambition in life but, but when everything is about you, you're out of balance. The wisdom of this world will create strife where, where you're constantly beating against other people. You're a troubled heart and you're a troubled life. Self-glory and arrogance. Self-focus, self-deceptive. That, that, that you lie to yourself, that you think you're better than you actually are. Listen, guys, we're not half as good as we think we are. We're sinners saved by grace, man. We don't know everything. We're not as, nearly as good as we think we are. And, and listen, if it wasn't for the grace of God, we'd all be in a world of trouble. Earthly. That means we, we live for the moment. We live for the temporal stuff. We think, I, I got to have it right now, and, and, and I, I got to fix you now. I got to do this now. I gotta, it's, no. It's fleshly. It's always about our desires. If we're not careful as we communicate and, and as we live our lives, we, we, we become so self-absorbed. And then that last phrase, devilish or demonic, it is literally evil. Man. It is a heart lacking in God's wisdom and his truth. And a heart like that uses words to destroy. It's a heart minus of God's word and the wisdom and spirit of God. That's why, why Paul writes over in Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edifying, that ye may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Remember, we say what is in our hearts. Amen. What is daily being placed in our heart? begins to transform our hearts. Spending time alone with God. Coming to a, a conference like this. Being in worship. Prayer. All that is putting in our hearts the things that ought to be there. Now, I'm going to say something here and Guys are pretty good about, you know, we just go on. 
We go on a lot of times and we never resolve issues. That's where bitterness comes from, things that we've never resolved. Past hurts and failures, unresolved conflicts that are rooted in our heart and those things have never been surrendered to God. Where we've been hurt and we have not yet forgiven them. Past failures and, and, and we, we have not forgiven ourselves. And, 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 and guys are notorious for this. We make up for the lack of the peace in our heart by sometimes lashing out at others. There's a saying, hurting people hurt others. That's why it's so very important that we get it together in our heart. Because if we don't, all we got to do is listen. And we'll know if you've got it together or not. Let's look at the summation here. This unwise person with the wrong perspective leads to a life filled with jealousy, self-ambition, disorder, disharmony, chaos. It becomes a life marked by a variety of worthless, good-for-nothing things that lead to pain and a broken life. Look what it says in verse 16. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. I didn't come here this weekend to tell you what to say. God laid on my heart to come here this weekend and through the word of God, touch your heart. If Christ can touch your heart and get you to, to reset to truly stop and examine and get what is right within the soul, then what you say and what you do will reflect God's wisdom and not yours. You must be honest with God about your heart. Getting your heart and your tongue under control can only be done by surrender to God. Are you at peace with God and others? Many years ago, I, I, I heard that wonderful picture. I, I saw a picture in a book, and you know, I was working with some things in my life it says if I can get the vertical right God in my heart and, and the great thing about the New Testament it, there's never a disconnect if this is right this will be right if I'm right with God I'm a better husband if I'm right with God I'm a better brother in Christ I'm a better worker I'm a better father. But if this, if I'm relying on my wisdom and the input I'm getting in my life is not God, I react to life from the culture of this world. I've got to get this right. Are your relationships marked? By confusion and pain. Now, here's the contrast. What if you choose wisdom? Choose to be wise. Look at these. It says, but the wisdom that is from above, God's wisdom, is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Man, that's the total opposite of one another. 
where where we have confusion and chaos because it's in the heart. But when we follow God's wisdom, there is peace. There's assurance. There's confidence. Let's look at the marks of godly wisdom very quickly. First, God's wisdom will produce that which is pure. To be free from anything that is morally unclean. You know, if if my heart is what it ought to be, godly wisdom will allow me to have a conversation that's pure. With guys and also with women. I should never find myself cute and flirtatious. That's not the wisdom of God. Amen, preacher. And then it will have the mark of peace. The attitude and demeanor of peace and security. Uh, It has that ability where, where the words that I use, they bring peace, not confusion. That's really great for the body of Christ. That what we interact and and as we talk about issues at the church and we talk about situations and this and that, we ought to be using words that bring unity and harmony and peace. Not confusion. Not doubt. But peace. Gentle. Gentle. To possess a spirit of control that gives confidence and tolerance. It, it, it's marked by the fact that it has the right perspective of self. We see ourselves as we really are, as God sees us, that we have value with God, we have value with God, but also does my brother and sister in Christ have value. Therefore, as I speak to them, as I talk to them, as as I interact with them, I must give them the value that God has given to them. They are redeemed as I am redeemed. I'm no better than they are. Amen. Mm. You don't abuse others with your words or with your actions. Then there's being reasonable. That means easy to be entreated. To possess the spiritual understanding and discernment, desiring to be available to other people, that we stop long enough to hear what people are saying and we stop long enough to speak to them what God would have us to say to them. I don't know if Annie May Spike ever truly knew I think that was just her character but her words were so timely we need to be so sensitive to the spirit of God and to our brothers in Christ we don't know what our words can do that are directed by the Holy Spirit God lays on your heart to speak to them speak to them because you offer hope You offer life. You offer those things that can keep a brother going. We all need to be cheered on. Amen? Full of mercy. It isn't so easy to criticize. It it isn't so easy not to forgive. Full of mercy and good fruits. that, That we not only show understanding and mercy, but we offer compassion. We step into the life and we say the things God would have us to say. And we're willing to walk the mile with our brothers in Christ. You're in trouble. I'm in trouble too. You're my brother. I'll walk with you. You're carrying a load. Let me help you carry that load. I will be there for you. Sometimes we we may not have the words. Just being there. We were talking about it the other day, marking myself, uh, the power of presence. Just being there. I like this impartial. 
the willingness to do the right thing based on God's wisdom. That, that I will tell you what is right. I'm not looking to make friends with you. I'm looking to tell you the truth, what is right. I'm not looking to get on your bandwagon. I'm looking to tell you the truth with love and with compassion and with a spirit of meekness. That's holding one another accountable. That's speaking love to one another. And then this last one, without hypocrisy. That what we say has no duplicity in it. Our, our words and our actions are compatible. Isn't that good? Now, let's summarize this one. The wise person. Look what it says here. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace and of them that make peace. If I choose God's wisdom to, to rule in my life, to come forth from my tongue, to come forth from, from what I do, I will bear the fruits of God in and through my life. It uses the term, the fruit of righteousness. It means that I'm in right standing. That's right. The, the vertical is right. Therefore, I, have, I can sow fruits based on the fact that my heart is right with God. I'm in fellowship with him. I can walk through life and give hope. Be there. Be there in love and care and, and encouragement. I can, I can inspire. Mm. We're told in this verse that the fruit is peace. It is more than the lack of conflict. It is the state and condition of assurance and confidence and the control of God that the byproduct of God's wisdom in my life is I'm at peace. I have security. I have assurance. I have confidence. He is the authority and I'm doing life under his command. Amen? You get it? You, you got to get this right. That this might be right. God's wisdom and the words in our life will always produce peace, security, and assurance. Your words ought to bring to the lives of those around you peace, security, assurance, and love. Are your words bringing that to those that you interact with. Isaiah chapter, 50, uh, Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17 says, And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Your greatest responsibility within the body of Christ is to bring harmony, peace, and unity. We are called in this paragraph to be peacemakers. Last night, I talked about we're called to be ambassadors. That's in this world. But within the church, we're called to bring peace. One of the single greatest things a church can have about it is unity, harmony, and peace with God in peace with one another. The fruit of righteousness is sown in the peace of them that make peace. What are we talking about? We're talking about using words of hope. Words that edify, build up, inspire, that, that tell, you don't know who's ready to quit around you. That God may use you to tell the word, uh, tell your brothers in Christ, don't quit. 
that you have value, you are loved. Let me ask you a couple of questions as we close. Are we at peace in our hearts with God this morning? Are you at peace with God this morning in your heart? Are your accounts clear with him? Are they hurts there that you need to give to him this morning that he can use you as his spokesman within the body of Christ? Number two, are our words being used to build up others or am I guilty? of tearing down others. Number three, do I view other Christians within the body of Christ as my brothers and sisters in Christ? Am I giving value to those who are around me? Am I sowing seeds of peace and unity within the body of Christ? Am I sowing seeds of peace in my relationship with my wife and my children? Am I offering them hope, inspiration, and encouragement? by what I say. We are called not to conflict, but to bring peace. Are we peacemakers? The world around us is in confusion. It has infiltrated, and remember James is writing to Christians. It has infiltrated the church. Last night I talked about you having the power of God within you through the power of the gospel. You have the wisdom of God in you to speak the words that offer life, power, inspiration to one another. Let us be peacemakers for Christ. Father, we thank you so much for your word. God, I thank you that these men have have so patiently listened this morning with their hearts. I don't know what is within them, but Lord, I know within my heart, within my life, I'm constantly having to take inventory. Lord, we use so many words. Let us slow down and take inventory. I pray not a single man today would not stop sometime during the day and look in their heart. And think about the wife that you've given to them. The children, the, the lives of life, and how important it is that, that we use the wisdom of God to make them what you want them to be. God, help us, I pray, Holy Spirit. Make your truth real to us. And we'll give you all the honor, all the glory for what you're going to do. God, I'm not a judge. I'm not here to judge anybody. I'm I'm just, I'm here as a mailman. I've just delivered the mail today. May they open it up, may they take it, and may they apply it to their life. And Lord, I ask all this in Christ's name and for his sake, amen.